I'm here to talk about hypercool infrastructure. And uh, uh, being hypercool is, uh, is uh, there's a correlation with these glasses and my presentation, right? These, uh, these I got about four years ago in uh, Austin on my first OpenStack summit. We had, uh, we had a um, grand unification party for our storage systems, software-defined storage systems. We had just welcomed our Ceph into our family, Red Hat family, and uh, they gave these out. This, uh, I bet you these are a uh, collector item now. I've got to hang on to them. Um, but why did I call my presentation cool, right? Why hyper cool infra? Did not like the converged word, right? Needed to preserve starting C. I could have used crammed or, or uh, complex, but then I probably wouldn't get it accepted here and wouldn't be in front of you today. Agenda, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about what hyperconverged is. Uh, what drivers are there and what are the use cases. And then we, we're gonna cover really quick the three Red Hat um, uh, solutions that we have out there. And uh, talk about architectural considerations, some get into implementation. And then uh, I'll just touch upon performance and scale con considerations and then we, we talk about futures where we are thinking this might lead us. And then I'll leave some time for Q and A's. So what does Wikipedia says about hyperconverged infrastructure? And there are a few words that jump out at me at least, right? Off the shelf x86 servers, right? With direct attached storage and has some intelligent software behind the whole thing, right? How about hyperconverged.org talks about simplification and savings and also it delivers on the promise of software defined data center at the technological level right and finally scale computing one of the one of the players in the space says hypervisor plus convergence is hyperconvergence right the convergence piece reminds me uh, about, not necessarily, about eight years ago, nine years ago, when, uh, when the, the keywords were vBlock or FlexPod, right? And they were multi-million dollar solutions that were very proprietary and very, uh, very expensive, right? So um, the hypervisor here is, is our x86 has become so prevalent and this is what makes this solution really, really attractive to both the customers uh, as well as the vendors that are, uh, that are creating these solutions, right? Um, what are the drivers? So as this is pretty self-explanatory, right? So lower cost of entry and smaller hardware footprint. We want to have it as small as possible so that uh, it's uh, easier to, to, um, to standardize, to get a packaged hardware. Um, and uh, this reminds me of one of my first customers uh, who wanted to implement exactly that. They wanted to put Ceph and Nova Compute on the same hardware, right? And that was, again, about four years ago. And, um, we were saying, whoa, 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 stop. Uh, think what you're doing, right? You're, you're actually getting your uh, KVM processes competing with Ceph OSD processes, and uh, they can easily step on each other, right? So you might not have, uh, maybe during normal operation, you'll be fine, but as soon as Ceph needs to do some recovery, you might not be so fine, right? So, but, you know, four years later, 
we still talk, we're talking about exactly those solutions to the problem that was described uh, way back then. Uh, and we are, we are uh, creating these solutions for exactly that reason, right? People want to take out maximum utilization out of their hardware that they purchased. And uh, as far as use cases, uh, notice uh, the first two are kind of uh, uh, NFV, which is really, really hot with was, was our telcos, uh, uh, distributed NFV and VCPE solutions. Um, and then we also have uh, a remote office, branch office, uh, mostly for Gluster and, uh, and uh, uh, Rev solution. And then one of the most, the one that I, I really like uh, you know, if you are interested in hyperconverged, you start with lab or sandbox, right? You put it in, minimum hardware footprint, and then go from there. If it works, awesome. Test, test, test. Uh, push it out to production. Okay. So what are our Red Hat solutions, right, in hyperconverged space? Traditional virtualization, overt plus cluster, private cloud, just talked about it, right? Uh, OSP plus Red Hat storage, Ceph storage. And we also have containerized cloud apps, right? Uh, Hyperconverged solution for that. With OpenShift uh, container platform, um, along with Gluster again. Okay, what is, what is the uh, Rev S, as we have named it? Uh, code name Grafton, what does that look like? Very, very simple, right? Three physical nodes uh, with Gluster storage attached, or direct storage, right? So Gluster bricks, and uh, just has a hosted engine uh, uh, that is highly available and can run on either one of those three. Um, some requirements, limitations, I would strongly encourage if you're interested in this, uh, go, to, go to our site, I, I attached the link, the slides are gonna be available. Uh, currently, the beta page shows up, but we are very, very close to actually making this into fully supported uh, option and GA version, okay? So the key note here, exactly three physical nodes. There's no scalability at this point yet but we are definitely working for the next, uh, next version uh, to actually scale out the Grafton nodes, okay? Um, okay, this is the other piece. This is the private cloud solution, uh, Red Hat solution. Uh, I like to think of it as in three layers, right? You have your undercloud. In uh, RHEL OSP, it's called director. And then you have the control layer where all the OpenStack services run and also um, supporting services such as Galera Cluster or Pacemaker or HA Proxy, they all run on that very important layer, right? And then obviously on the bottom, there's Nova Compute plus Ceph OSD layer, right? As you notice that middle layer, there's no disk attached or there is RAID 1 disk for, for local boot, but there is no Ceph disk attached. So um, requirements and limitations for that. Here's one thing I will strongly, strongly recommend. If you are at all interested in this particular solution, or even if you are interested only on the private cloud HCI solution, make sure you go and download this reference architecture. Okay, it was written by John Fulton. Um, he's, a, he's a software engineer that, that works for, with these reference architectures, and he has maintained this one since Liberty cycle. So Liberty, we had a solution that was OSP 8 plus Ceph 1.3, which is a hammer release. And uh, so, so download that. Follow, that, follow those, those steps, he goes through exactly how you would set it up, right? And uh, so it's very, very, very useful. I used it in my solution as well. So um, up to one data center, 42 nodes, uh, I would say implement three at, to start out, right? Three, double to six, go to 12 maybe, 
but don't start with 42. We are, we are thinking at Red Hat that as soon as you, you know, if you really need a big, uh, big cluster, right, you'd probably much better off just separating and, and doing it the way we currently, non-HCI way, all right? So be careful with, with, with getting too many of those. Um, and here's what it looks like uh, when, when, you, when we kind of um, just map it out. So physical nodes Grafton, physical nodes uh, for control plane and compute. This is kind of a fully supported system, right? So we install under cloud, we install a couple of management systems or VMs on our, uh, on our uh, Grafton nodes, right? And then we kind of, I wanted to show you, this is kind of a self-encompassing what Rev S constitutes now, right? And then let's do the same, let's do a logical what, what, uh, what our OSP HCI looks like. And notice one thing here, that, that when I first started the project, I was like, okay, Randy, did you, did you really went through all this effort to set up uh, these, the, a completely different uh, software-defined storage and, and the cluster just to locate this undercloud on it, right? So probably, maybe it makes sense to some, but may, uh, you know, obviously it gives you footprint to, to put a lot other of our, you know, like maybe satellite or free IPA or what have you, right? On a, on, but, but as far as uh, our goal of actually setting up a really good, you know, um, cluster for uh, our Ceph and, um, you know, OSP, maybe it's not as efficient, right? So let's take a look at what hypercool infra would look like if I, if I kind of combine them a little better. Now check this out, right? So six, um, six physical nodes. Um, we have our Grafton nodes, and we have our uh, compute OSD nodes, and every one of them has software-defined storage, right? So Gluster in, in case of the top uh, row, and Ceph in case of the bottom. And then let's see what this looks like. Now we are virtualizing over cloud control nodes slash Ceph controllers, or uh, yeah, Ceph monitors, I'm sorry. Um, and still adding our management pieces. And now look at this, and look at, look at the overlay there, right? So under cloud and all our over cloud control nodes and Ceph monitors, those now are living on top of, on top of uh, uh, our Grafton nodes or, or Rev, uh, RevS, and now it's a lot more efficient. Implementation details on the, uh, on the RevS. Um, just, just really quickly, you install the nodes, you configure the SSH keys so that you can deploy um, Gluster on all three of them at the same time, and then you uh, basically deploy Gluster via Cockpit plugin and also gDeploy tool, which is Gluster deployment tool that uses Ansible for deployment. And so uh, after that, uh, deploy hosted engine. You c continue with, with that deployment process, and then we create some, some networks. Obviously, we're going to need not only Gluster storage, which we want to put probably on 10, uh, 10 gigabit uh, network, but also you probably want to, want to, you will need to, you know, create a provisioning network where you're going to actually build your OSP um, over cloud nodes and then uh, the rest of the OSP isolated networks, okay? So, and then basically once you've, uh, uh, once you've done that, you can add additional hypervisors, the rest of the hypervisors, upload the RHEL 7.3 guest image, create a template from that image, and uh, off you go. So now you can actually create a virtual machine on uh, RevS. As you notice, the NIC, uh, NIC we, we, uh, we have two NICs there. Uh, Overt Management 1 
and we, we are running provisioning on the NIC2. Um, and then we can uh, actually install and configure uh, director via Ansible under cloud playbook. I wrote that a few, uh, almost a year ago, and I have used it at customers, you know, and just keeps getting better and better, right? Uh, trying to cover different areas. This is just an under cloud role, what it consists of. Uh, it's not the entire, entire thing. Um, then we prepare and upload over cloud images. If, if any of you have, have actually deployed triple O, you will no, note that um, one of the things that you really want to need to troubleshoot is when, the, uh, when you are deploying a node and something is wrong in your NIC configuration and then you, you can't even access those nodes. So uh, getting to the console is pretty critical and if you don't have root password, you, you wouldn't be able to get there. So, um, for customization of triple O heat templates, that comes next. Uh, we want to, uh, again, strongly encourage, this is within reference architecture, go to GitHub, do a Git clone on, the, on that uh, um, HCI work that John Fulton is uh, maintaining here. And then you will just adjust a few things, right? You, you, you're definitely probably going to adjust the NIC configs on the bottom of that first column. Uh, for compute and for controller, um, but uh, you know, and I adjusted it to actually include uh, SSL, right? I wanted to make sure my undercloud and overcloud both use SSL for public endpoints, okay? And uh, then there is a bunch of scripts that actually do the. Um, it's actually coming up. Uh, it's that does the isolation and tuning. Right? So this, if nothing else from those scripts, then absolutely make sure you read this chapter seven, because in here, he talks about exactly how you apply the NUMA changes and CPU pinning, uh, you know, so that we can, we can ensure that Ceph OSD and Nova Compute uh, processes on the same nodes actually going to behave nicely, no matter what the uh, uh, what the situation is. Um, okay, and uh, here is uh, where I ran into my first big issue, and that had to do with um, with uh, uh, overt ironic driver. For some reason, I had assumed that we already have an overt. Um, ironic driver available, but that is not the case, right? So I, I found an RFE that actually requested exactly that use case, right? If you, if you are going to put a controllers, controllers on, uh, on a um, rev or overt cluster that, uh, you know, you should, you should have an ironic driver that, that fulfills all the functions that ironic driver is supposed to do. It's not just power on, power off, and status. It's also set the boot device, and there's a couple other ones. Um, so what I ended up here, ended up cheating a little bit, right? Instead of using these, uh, these within overt, I put them on a KVM host, right? And then used virtual BMC um, proxy to actually, uh, you know, uh, be able to provision, to power on off and stuff. So let's, let's here, here's a better view of that. Um, so if you can see on the left side, I have a OSP controller slash Ceph Mon, which is living on KVM. And on the right side, I have a, a you know, bare metal, one of my um, Dell nodes on, a, um, you know, with its, uh, with its uh, configuration there. As you notice, the, the big difference is there's a PM port. Uh, you know, when you, when you use virtual BMC, uh, you, you actually uh, uh, need to define on your KVM host, you need to define some ports, 
and you need to run some virtual BMC processes on that KVM host. And then you are, you're actually, um, you know, when you actually do introspection or deployment, you, uh, you use that to, to actually target that KVM host on that particular port, okay? And then I'm also using, as you see, capabilities. Instead of uh, profile matching, I'm using node placement. And this is the deploy script. It's slightly modified again uh, due to SSL and due to um, that rel registration. And then we deploy, right? And those of you who have done quite a few um, uh, triple O deployments using our OpenStack platform, uh, um, using Undercloud and, and using our approach, you'll, you'll appreciate that when you, get, when you get stack create completed successfully or stack update completed successfully, that's always a good news. Now, uh, public URL, um, notice how I'm using SSL. I'm using fully qualified domain name. So that's one of the changes that I implemented. Um, and here's a couple, couple screenshots of my fully functional um, control nodes, right, uh, as well as compute nodes, and Ceph health status that shows, right, we have, uh, we have a healthy cluster with 21 OSDs. And then finally, we, we did some additional tasks, so installed uh, uh, our cloud forms, our management platform, and uh, we would configure the infrastructure provider for Rev and cloud provider for OSP, and then we can provision some uh, Rev or OSP instances to validate that functionality, okay? Uh, I'm missing a slide for Ansible Tower, but that's another really, really uh, useful tool, very popular tool for us uh, that customers love to put on the, onto their infrastructure. RevS would be the right place in this, uh, in this setup. This is my POC hardware, right? This is a nine-year-old servers, six of them, right? Uh, like you, you see there's 746 gig drives, right? So that's 21, 21 OSDs. Um, and uh, as you can see, some old, old, old uh, switch, uh, switch on the bottom, the Qantas switch, but it worked. Everything worked uh, uh, for a production for, in its current state, you would probably, if you wanted to, to follow our standards and our supported stuff, uh, as soon as it becomes fully supported and uh, not only fully supported, but maybe GA, uh, you would probably want to use something like that initially, so it's nine nodes instead of six, right? But, but uh, so this would uh, account for controller and Ceph monitor actually being on uh, physical hardware, okay? And that's what uh, uh, our reference architecture also uh, uses there. Um, um, proposed hardware, um, if we were gonna use for hypercool infra, right? If we get that over driver, and I've actually talked to a couple of my colleagues during this conference, and we are absolutely determined to get that over driver, ironic driver in place. Uh, we just need to find the, the right developer with the right skill set for both uh, uh, overt as well as ironic drivers. Um, so we'll get that done. You know, and, and at that point, you would actually be able to use something like this uh, for proposed hardware. Uh, performance characteristics, you could, you could find these in, uh, again, in the reference architecture or our uh, documentation for RevS. But uh, the key is make sure you use 10 gig uh, interfaces for, and jumbo frames for all your storage uh, and uh, also probably tenant traffic, and just make sure you understand that there's only three node cluster, exactly three nodes for the uh, RevS stuff. On a, on a Ceph OSD nodes, we can actually, like I said, we can uh, scale up uh, quite high. Uh, as far as futures go, uh, short term, we want to um, 
we want to uh, reduce that footprint if we can. Uh, would, be, would be very, very cool if we were able to, to get there. Um, again, the only requirement that I could see is getting that Pixie overt ironic driver. Uh, further automate this HCI build out using Ansible. I've done some work with some, uh, some of my customers uh, already in the past. It shouldn't be too difficult. It's, it's, it goes beyond just Ansible, um, just uh, uh, Ansible on the cloud playbook. It goes uh, further by actually trying to, uh, trying to automate pretty much the entire spectrum of, of the solution. And then we at Red Hat love OVN, right? And, and that's a very recent development, and we're going to ensure that, is, that it goes through all of our product line, the entire product line, including our OpenShift offerings, will actually have that OVN as one of the options. Uh, I mean, it's, it might not be as short term as, as someone would like, but it, it definitely um, is something you should pay attention, see the development. Our, one of our top, uh, top guys, uh, Russell Bryant, is, is actually core developer and core contributor to that project, and, uh, and we, definitely, um, we definitely are after uh, getting the OVN um, in our products. And that would be really cool to actually have a, a, a SDN layer that is exactly, you know, um, we can plug and play with, with, the, with the Neutron stuff. And as far as longer term, <laughs> we can containerize OSP services, right? I mean, one of the things, I don't know how about you, uh, about you guys, but one of the things, I've, the big theme of this conference is Kubernetes. After a while, you start getting tired, you know, you see it over and over and over every, every session. But it's definitely here. It definitely uh, is, is a great solution, and we are working on it. We are working as we speak. Our engineers in, at OpenStack, uh, our OpenStack engineers are very, very committed to actually make it work within our OpenStack platform. So it's coming. Um, I can't give you any uh, timelines, but it's, but it's definitely uh, going to get there. We just go. Uh, we just take uh, baby steps and go slowly but surely. Uh, we'll get there. Uh, so uh, with that, um, I am in my Q&A uh, part. If uh, anybody has any questions, please just. All right, if there are no questions, uh, you guys have about 10 minutes to spare or come talk to me after this. <clears throat>